Hi everyone, Ronnie from IKN. So what we want to talk to you today about is shoulder pain or how we view shoulder pain or the assessment and treatment of shoulder pain through an IKN lens or through a neuroanatomical lens. Now what we want to try and do is we want to try and relate this back to a case that we saw recently where we had a client uh, develop a gradual onset of shoulder pain over the course of two to three months that, that flared up or worsened after playing golf recently. Now this individual had no had no clear mechanism of injury, of injury at the shoulder, but what he did have was a, a prior injury at the, at the hand, where he broke three fingers of the hand two months before developing this discomfort at the shoulder. Okay, so what we wanna try and do with you today is, is go through the thought process that, that kind of goes through our minds when we're assessing a client with this kind of non-specific shoulder pain. So we need to look at it through a neural layer and, a, and an anatomical layer. Okay, looking at top-down and bottom-up uh, processes. So when we're looking at the shoulder, we, we obviously know that we, need to, we may need to do work around the shoulder, locally at the shoulder, but we also need to view the shoulder within the context of the entire upper limb and also within the context of the entire midline, particularly from the ribcage up. Okay? Now, if we were to look at it from the, the neural layer first through the upper limb, Think about it for a second. How do you think the nervous system organizes movement of the upper limb? Where does it place its conscious control when we're actually moving our upper limb? Do you think it, it wants to consciously think about what's happening at the shoulder when we move our upper limb towards a, to pick up something? Do you think it wants to, to think about what's happening at the elbow? What direction should the elbow move when we're reaching towards a target of interest? Or does it organize the movement around the distal end effector, the end point, the distal end point, the hand in this case? It makes sense that we're going to strategically organize the movement of the upper limb around the end effector because the end effector is the, the local body segment that's directly interacting with the environment. Okay, and that allows us to, to tolerate load or transmit load in a, in a distal to proximal fashion and allow for the dampening of stress acting on our limb so that all the tissues proximally don't have to express too much tone. Okay? Now, let's look at it through the shoulder and the hand in this case. So, if I have some kind of experience of discomfort or pain at the shoulder, think about how that's going to disrupt that distribution of, of conscious control at the, at the upper limb from a neural gradient standpoint. We know that pain is a conscious, it's a conscious process, it's, it's a conscious experience. So just having discomfort around the shoulder is going to disrupt that neural gradient at the upper limb. But also think about it this way, if I have a past injury at the hand, do you think that individual is going to feel comfortable reaching outside the base of support and, and engaging that hand with the environment, grasping things with their hand to build that distal to proximal load distribution? Perhaps not, okay? Now, if we look at it from a limb versus a midline standpoint, we want the upper limb to be able to express those features to, to dampen stress acting on our, on our upper limb. And we want the midline to express the capacity to be reflexive, to act as a reflexive platform to adapt to that upper limb movement. So when we reach, our body doesn't move with it, okay? So if we have that past injury at the hand, and if, we are, if we're currently experiencing pain at the shoulder, that's not going to, to allow my nervous system to develop the capacity to express those features at the entire upper limb. And that's not going to allow the midline to express the capacity to be reflexive. Okay, so from a neural gradient standpoint, we've, we've lost that capacity to express a sustainable or a robust upper limb and a robust midline. So what happens is that if we're not moving the upper limb and engaging it with the environment, we may see excessive uh, protective tone at the midline or anticipatory tone at the midline where we lack the ability to dissociate the upper limb from the midline from a neural standpoint. Okay, and if we were to look at it from an anatomical standpoint, if we look at how the, the, the muscles are arranged, the, the passive tissues are arranged throughout the, the upper limb, we can see there's a lot more uh, muscle mass proximally than there is as we move distally, where we have lots more muscle mass here, much less muscle mass here, more passive and elastic tissues as we move distally. So from an anatomical standpoint, the upper limb has evolved to be able to, to, to dampen stress distally so that it enables everything proximally to take on more of a reflexive, subconscious, um, adaptable, adaptable role with upper limb movements. Okay? So when we're looking at the shoulder, we don't want to just look locally at the shoulder. 
We don't want to just do work at the shoulder only, but we want to feed in the, this neural and anatomical gradient and restore that neural anatomical gradient to improve the robust features of the upper limb, but also the robust features of the midline as well. And that means merging what we, what we call feedback focused strategies and protective strategies in the sense that feedback focus strategies are improving the, the missing qualities, the missing local features at the shoulder. But then we want to feed that into the entire upper limb, but also into the entire midline as well. And we, when we can merge those feedback focus strategies and those protective features that allow us to move in a robust manner and manage stress as we move, then we can really facilitate much more positive change and really prepare the client to move the upper limb in the real world with, with, with less energy expenditure, with, a much more, with much more ability to be able to handle stress and manage external perturbations acting on our body, okay? Now what we do in our, in our IKN Level 1 and Level 2 courses is we develop a framework of assessment and a framework of treatment to try and drive those feedback focus strategies and those protective focus strategies to really get the client from, from experiencing pain to more so distributing good quality neural and anatomical control at the upper limb and at the shoulder, which really allows us to, to step back and look at the movement of the upper limb and the midline through a contextual lens, not just looking at it from a standpoint of let's get the shoulder moving more, but how do we enable the, the upper limb and the midline to express these robust features to ensure that pain discomfort is not necessary as a protective response at the shoulder. Okay, so again, it just involves us stepping back and widening our focus as well as narrowing our focus at the shoulder. Too often we narrow our focus far too soon and we forget to widen our focus. So if we narrow our focus and widen our focus and merge that within a, a, a framework of, of treatment and rehab, then we can really have much, uh, a much greater effect on the robustness and restoring those robust movement qualities at the upper limb and reduce the, the value that pain has at the shoulder, create an environment where pain holds no protective value or no survival value from a neurological standpoint. So if this sounds interesting to you, be sure to check out our IKN Level 1 and Level 2 courses to really understand and, and develop that capacity to build that, that assessment and, and treatment framework.